Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our final Future Scientist webinar of this year. Um, it will be a very special webinar uh, with a topic uh, I'm very interested in myself. Um, and we're going to reflect on our relation to nature together with um, the ecologist, philosopher and Buddhist Matthijs Schouten. Um, and it's all around who do we think we are. It's also the title of this talk. Um, is the planet there for us uh, to use or are we tenants, stewards of the planet or do we live in a partnership with nature um, or do we really participate with everything around us? Um, and to move towards a truly sustainable future, more and more philosophers conclude that the radical change in humans' view on nature is needed. And during today's talk, we will hear more about the implications for science in particular, um, if nature should move from a position of an object to a, a position of subject. Um, so we have a Mentimeter question, as usual, ready for you to get us started a little bit. So um, my colleague is going to share the screen so you can see the question. And also the code. So yes, there we go. So uh, you go to menti.com um, and use the code uh, that's also in the chat on YouTube, but the code is 6205 and then 5594. Um, and it's going to be a world word cloud. So um, everything to do with, with which words do you think that describe the Western view of nature or on nature? Um, anything that comes to mind, uh, you can share here. So I think there were already two words there. Uh, it's a tool. We see it as a tool, we see it as a resource, as a, as a food resource. I think that's definitely true. Um, as a very functional thing, recreation. Uh, as an opportunity, something that we need to manage, nature. Uh, our garden, yes. We just bought a new house with a huge garden, so plenty to do. Uh, something beautiful, uh, in awe of nature, so, so we also have some respect for it, maybe. Uh, despotism. Something separate from humans, so there are a lot of words coming in now. Disenchanted. So it's nice to see it's a nice mix of all kinds of different views uh, from the same Western perspective, maybe. Um, but already here, there's quite some differences, I would say, uh, from how we how we look at it, the uh, different angles. Um, both like it's beautiful relaxation, but it's also a resource. Um, it's, it's separate from humans. Uh, we rule it and we have to manage it. So those are all kind of different views, I think, on the same uh, topic. Um, so this is this is great, uh, and this is exactly what we're gonna discuss today and during this hour. So Matthijs Schouten um, is currently a professor at University College Cork and University College Galway in Ireland, um, and he also works at Stadbosbeer here in the Netherlands. And he's a he's a great speaker, um, and we are honored to have him here today. So welcome, Matthijs. You can turn on your camera and turn on your microphone, um, and uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Stephanie. I was just a little remark that fascinates me. You introduced me as an ecologist, a philosopher, and a Buddhist. Why the Buddhist? I, I got that somewhere from the internet. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but would you introduce the speaker as a, an ecologist, a philosopher, and a Christian? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's, it's not a criticism. I always find it quite fascinating that yeah. normally, normally the, the whatever your spiritual inclination is never mentioned. But when yeah, you're a Buddhist, true. suddenly it uh, is this apparently something special. Well, I think it fits very well with the topic. Okay, um, great. So, so that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> um, dear colleagues, um, as I already uh, discussed with the other participants that are on screen, this is not going to be a, a seminar in which I give a long lecture and then you can ask some questions. 
um, it's going to be a bit different. You see, I'm, I'm on the one hand an ecologist, I was trained as an ecologist, biologist. On the other hand, a philosopher. And that has to do with the fact that when I studied biology, and that's a long time ago, I started to study in 1969, that was the period in which we all became aware of the impact of humanity on this planet. Huh? Uh, Rachel Carson had written her book, Silent Spring in 1962, and I hope that you all know the book and all, also know what the impact was because her um, research on pesticides and, their, and the fact that they ended up in food chains and in that way they would have a long impact far away from where they were used and also into the distant future that 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 insight struck like a bombshell and that led to thousands of publications on this topic which showed that our impact as humans is far reaching on this planet and that also led to the famous uh, limits to growth growth report of the club of rome so the late 60s and 70s were a period in our history in which you could say environmental awareness or env environmental consciousness was sort of emerging and i was part of that emergence because i remember that the first sentence i ever heard in the holy halls of academia on a Monday morning when I was a young student and, and attended the first class in Neimingen University at 10 to 9 in the morning. I have no idea why they started at 10 to 9, but they did. And a professor walked in and the first words I ever heard, ladies and ladies and gentlemen students, you have to realize that we are now in a global environmental crisis. And that sort of basically framed my whole academic work. And biology gave me answers to the question what the impact of humanity on ecosystems is, but gave no answer to the questions, why the hell do we humans do what we do on this planet? So then I decided maybe I should also study something else and then in Nebing and you could study comparative religion and philosophy. So that's what I did. So I ended up to be a combined ecologist philosopher. And for me, this this asked the, the questions about our relationship with nature have been quite prominent in my work. I've worked in Wageningen University for 25 years and still work in, in Ireland. And it has been very much part of my education, my teaching, and also of my research. Now, ladies and gentlemen, so that will also be the topic of what I'm going to do today. And what I want to do is sort of picture arena. And within that arena, a sort of philosophical arena, with, within that arena, I want to pose some questions that constantly um, also are questions that are in my mind and I don't have to, the exact answers to. So I will, I, I will picture an arena, then pose a number of questions and hope that with the, uh, the people present on screen, but also with you in the audience, we can elaborate a little bit on these questions. Uh, you all know that we are now in an, um, in an era you could say a geological era that we have called the Anthropocene. You also know that there's a lot of discussion on this term because the term itself already is an indication of the position that we give ourselves on this planet. You know, the term was coined by Crutzen, a Dutch, a Dutch scientist. And uh, whenever I talk to geologists, they always get very annoyed about this term because suddenly we, we, we have uh, sort of framed an era basically on our presence, and that is rather anthropocentric, um, before we even have become fossilized. So that is rather a, a strange way of dealing with the geological eras. Now, you all know what the Anthropocene entails. What I always tell in public lectures, the Anthropocene, that is the, the period in the history of the earth where humanity basically is shaping the face of the earth, um, on the one hand sounds very reassuring. Okay, we have everything under control, but you know all that the opposite is true because characteristic of the Anthropocene is that one crisis after the other looms at the horizon. We have the, the environmental crisis, the biodiversity crisis, the climate crisis, now we have a pandemic crisis, and many philosophers agree on the given that that is a result of how we treat this planet. And how we treat this planet is a result of who we think we are. And the basic question today is uh, that I want to pose is who do we think we are? And what does that mean for a position as a scientist? There is, a, there is an Australian philosopher, Clive Hamilton, who's written a lot on the Anthropocene, 
who, by the way, is uh, as a person rather pessimistic about the future, but that is besides the point. But um, he gives a number of possible reactions to the fact that there is an Anthropocene, which is caused by human activity and which is connected to various global crises. And he says, one of the reactions that you can have is just deny it. He calls that the, 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 the deniers. And you know, all know deniers. Donald J. Trump was a denier. Thierry Baudet in our country is a denier. I just heard him on television. And I thought, yes, that's also a denier. We can just deny the presence of uh, the problems. That's one way of approaching our Anthropocene reality. An other way, which um, Hamilton doesn't mention, but which, which I come across quite a lot in all kinds of public, public talks, is what I would call the fatalists. It's too late anyway. The Titanic is moving towards the iceberg and we cannot change the course of the Titanic anymore because that has so many historical backgrounds. We cannot change that course. So let's just party and then the world will, at least the human world will end. Okay, that's also an approach. There's another approach which you all are familiar with and that's the approach of the eco-modernist. And the eco-modernist is the person who has a very deep faith in science and technology and who has the feeling that yes, there are crises, but in the past we always have mastered crises through human, uh, through human creativity and uh, the, the human rationality and through scientific developments and through innovations, we'll go and do it again. When you listen to all kinds of political debates, this whole innovation image is very strongly there. And that has to do with the eco-modernist view, science and technology will solve the crisis. And my question is immediately, we are part of that scientific and technological community. In how far do we constantly um, reaffirm this image of the eco-modernist? So that will be one of the questions that we'll possibly deal with later. And then Hamilton comes with an other interesting stance. He says there's also a stance or a viewpoint that is shared by many philosophers in this world. We should change our view of our position on this planet. We should become post-humanists. Huh? We should move to, a, to a, a, a worldview in which we are not a center of all things. And there we come to a very interesting uh, issue. When I looked at uh, at the, how did you call that? The something something meter, the emo meter or whatever meter at the beginning, I saw a lot of terms which you immediately can, can associate with our Western worldview, which is all philosophers will agree to, an anthropocentric worldview in which we are the center of all things. We see ourselves as the focal point on this planet. And that has, ladies and gentlemen, and I want to, to, to as a philosopher, to, to um, um, explore this a little bit, that has a very long cultural history. The idea that we are the center of all things is not something that emerged yesterday within our Western civilization that has been there for almost 2,300 years. And as such, has become very much an ingrained part of our worldview without us even being aware of its origins anymore. And it may be, may be useful to, to look at a few origins of that Western worldview. Whenever I teach uh, worldviews and the Western worldview, I, I, I tell my students, you may not read Aristotle anymore. You may not even know where Aristotle was, but I can assure you, um, if you have grown up in the West, Aristotle is between your ears because Aristotle's view on the world has resonated very profoundly, very deeply in Western civilization until now. There's a few things that Aristotle did in his philosophy that are still resonating in our world view. One thing is that he designed what was later called the scala nature, the great ladder of being. And that great ladder of being, uh, and you will immediately recognize it, moves from minerals, to lower plants, that's primitive plants, to higher plants, that's vascular plants, to lower animals, which we now call invertebrates, then to higher animals, which we now call vertebrates, and finally to humans. This was used by Carl von Linne, Linnaeus, et cetera, et cetera, still part of our biology textbooks, a hierarchy of things. Interesting phenomenon, thinking in terms of hierarchy. 
And within this hierarchy, humans, Aristotle said, are at the top. Many um, similarities with all other aspects of nature, but one major distinction, difference, humans have a logos, a rational mind, which lacks in all other natural things. Interesting uh, approach, which we have sort of claimed as reality and truth until the work of Franz de Waal. Until quite recently, we felt that we were the only beings with reason. Hmm? Another thing that Aristotle did, and that also became a very crucial part of our Western worldview, he said, in nature, nothing happens without a purpose. In nature, everything has a purposefulness, an entelechia in Greek. It serves a functionality within the whole. And then he described the entelechia or the good or the purposefulness in the cosmos. And he said, the minerals are there to feed plants. That's their entelechia, the good for minerals, their purposefulness. The plants have the entelechia to feed animals and humans. That's their purposefulness. And the purposefulness or the entelechia, the good of animals is to feed and help humans. And the purpose of humanity or humans is rational development, the development of the logos to the highest degree, ultimately uh, to become a philosopher, you could say. And here we have an interesting worldview, a world, a hierarchical worldview with a functionality. Aristotle himself didn't believe in creating gods. For him, the order, the cosmos had been there and uh, always and will always be there. But later, Greek and Roman philosophers who believed in creating gods translated um, Aristotle's worldview to the gods have designed nature for human purposes. Interesting, interesting uh, quote by, by Cicero, Cicero was, do I need to mention sheep? When you see sheep, you see that they have thick, strong hair that shows beyond any reasonable, reasonable doubt that the gods designed sheep to deliver wool for human garments. Now this image of a nature designed for human purposes was taken on by Christianity. It's not in the Bible, nor the Old Testament, nor the New Testament, that image or worldview, but that worldview was taken on by Christian philosophers and thinkers. Huh? I don't know whether you ever heard that Martin Luther, the great reformer wrote that God created a day so that we all could go to work and he created the night so that we all could go and rest. And then he created fleas so that we would not rest too long. And then um, in the 17th century, there was quite a famous British scientist, Henry Moore, who wrote, God created cattle in order to keep beef fresh for human consumption. Now, these are interesting quotes because they show a world view that is ultimately anthropocentric, where we are the center of things, the highest being in creation, where the rest of creation serves that higher being. You also have to realize that, and I want to add a few aspects to this Western worldview, that for Aristotle, everything that lived and grew must have a soul. Not only humans had a soul, also animals had a soul, an animal soul, and plants had a soul, even the, the, the earth had a soul, a world soul that kept the, the globe turning around his axis. This image of an animated world was very much there in the classical, classical worldview. What happened in our Western Christian development, that the emphasis became very strong on the eternal human soul. And gradually you see in our worldview, a soul in nature moving to the background and ultimately even disappearing. And in that sense, the non-human reality becomes soulless. And then there's a last important development in, in, in the history of Western thought, and that's the Cartesian development. You all know René Descartes and his view on two substances, mind and matter, and ultimately um, stating that he hadn't been able to prove beyond any reasonable doubt that um, non-human entities would, could combine matter and mind. So for the time being, he, would, he assumed that only humans combined matter and mind and that the rest of reality was mindless. There, nature also lost mind. So what we took away from nature in the course of our Western development or Western worldview is first reason, then soul, 
however you defined it, and finally mind. And the ultimate result was that we remained as entities with reason, with soul and mind in a world of reasonless, soulless, mindless presences. And that is, as, as Bruno Latour, the contemporary French philosopher claims, uh, the moment where we had objectified the world completely, had made it into a world of objects surrounding us as the only subjects in this world. And then the world becomes a collective, of objects that are there for human use and space to be colonized. Hmm? Now, and a lot, of, a lot of modern philosophers claim that that worldview is at the roots of all the crises that we now have. The objectification of the world and seeing it as, as a storehouse of goods and services and nothing more than that. Now, so quite a lot of philosophers, including um, our Clive Hamilton claim, if we want to move towards a sustainable future, if we want to deal with the crises of the Anthropocene, we need to become post-humanists. We need to become um, beings that take a place in the collectivity of reality instead of seeing ourselves as separate and superior. Uh, and that's what is called post-humanism. And um, in order to, to introduce that, um, I, I want to give you some non-Western worldviews. And let, let me put it another way, alternative worldviews that in part are non-Western, in part have also become Western in, in, in the thinking of quite a number of modern Western philosophers. Um, see, Bruno Latour claims, and many philosophers agree, that we have objectified the world. We have taken the, 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 the basically everything that makes something a subject out of our surrounding reality. It has become a reality of objects. Um, that's not present in many other civilizations, many non-Western uh, civilizations. Nature hasn't become objectified. It is a subject or a collection of subjects. And um, there, the image of the human nature relationship or the human world relationship is a, is a worldview of partnership. Huh? We are presences that are a subjective presence, but are loads of other subjective presences with which we form partnerships. That's an image that you find in Buddhism, for instance, in Hinduism, in, in, in many other Eastern worldviews, also in very early worldviews and in, in, in tribal worldviews. It has been, been um, introduced into Western philosophy on one hand by Bruno Latour, on the other hand by Michel Serres, another French philosopher who claim uh, Bruno Latour states that if we want to move towards a more sustainable future, we should broaden our democracy to include non-human entities. We should have a parliament of things, a parliament in which humans and non-humans equally participate. And there you have a subjectification of the world. The, the, the modern, uh, uh, died recently, modern philosopher, Michel Serres claims that we should, uh, in our relationship with nature, move away from our anthropocentric view in claiming that nature is there as a storehouse of goods and services, but that we should build nature contracts as a social contract is the basis of our um, human society. And a social contract simply means that you have interests, but your uh, other members of society have other interests and you always have to find a way to combine the interests. You have your private interests and your public interests, your, private, your own interests, the other interests, and in your social contract, you need to be aware of the interests of the other. And that always means that you have a certain, um, uh, you don't move in just taking everything and claiming everything, you have to be aware of the other. Uh, Ceres claims we should do the same with nature. We move into nature, colonize it, use it, and not asking what the interests of nature are. So in, a, in towards a sustainable, the sustainable future, we should also build nature contracts, contracts with nature, in which we take a more humble position hmm, where not our own interests, but also the interests of nature are at stake. There you have an interesting view on 
an interesting other worldview, a worldview of partnership, not an anthropocentric despotic worldview, but a partnership worldview. There's another worldview that we recognize in, in environmental philosophy, because environmental philosophy has, has occupied itself for 30, 40 years with studying different worldviews and different views of the human nature relationship. There's another interesting one that I want to, to present to you by a quote, um, which, which is the first page of a book written by a, a Vietnamese philosopher. He was a Buddhist philosopher, is a Buddhist philosopher. And I just give you the quote that you find on the first page of his book. He says, when you open the book, page one, when you are a poet, and that's interesting, suddenly you, he asks you to view the world slightly different from the way you do it normally. He says, when you're a poet, you see a cloud floating in this sheet of paper. Because without clouds, trees cannot grow, and without trees, we have no paper. When you look deeper, you see sunshine in this sheet of paper. Without sunshine, trees do not grow, there's no paper. Looking deeper still, you see a logger, a woodcutter in this sheet of paper. The woodcutter cut a tree and brought it to the factory where it became paper. Looking deeper still, you see the woodcutter's parents. They're also in this paper. Looking deeper still, you see the grain that became the daily bread of the woodcutter who cut a tree and brought it to the factory where it became paper. And looking deeper still, you also see yourself in this paper now. It has become part of your consciousness, so you are in and with this paper now as well. And then he says, quite philosophically, in short, there's nothing I can point at that's not in and with this paper here and now. Time, space, sunshine, clouds, trees, humans. This paper only exists because all the other exists. Then he says, maybe we should abolish the verb to be because the verb to be suggests that entities and things can exist independent of the world around them but not like no one can exist independent of the world around them. So therefore, maybe we should use another verb. And he proposes the verb to interbe. And then a new realm of worldviews opens up. The view of interbeing or the view of what Bruno Latour calls the actor network, a sort of mesh of relations in which there are various focal points like us, but also like trees or like birds or like water or like whatever. We are an interrelated actor network. Nothing stands independent. We call this the worldview of participation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the point is that many modern philosophers claim if we want to move to a sustainable future, we should basically reassess our position on this planet and move away from an anthropocentric worldview to a more post-humanist worldview in which participation and partnership are more prominent in our relations with reality. Now, fascinating philosophically, but here comes my problem. What does that mean for us scientists? You see, the point is science is based on a paradigm of objectifying, making that which we research into an object with which we are supposed to have no relationships subjectively, subjectively because then we cannot do our work very well. I all know this paradigm, an objectified world in which we try to establish the facts, the realities, how it works, etc., etc. My first question is then, um, does that mean that science is independent of a worldview? We claim to be very objective. Is that truly so? Or have we as science emerged, scientists emerged from a worldview and are we perpetuating in the way we work this worldview, this worldview of an objective reality? Uh, I find it fascinating, this question, because we always claim uh, that we're independent of worldviews and that we just establish reality, the factual order of things and relationships of things. Is that true, ladies and gentlemen? Are we truly independent as scientists of worldviews? In what we research and how we communicate what we have found. You see, I found it fascinating 
to learn that in the time that I started to study biology, there was an enormous focus in ecology on competition. We did loads of competition between plants and between animals, etc., etc. And ingrained in our research was the study of competition in various ecosystems. What I've seen in the last 30, 40 years that in ecological research, the emphasis now is much more on cooperation, on symbiosis, on networks, on interactions. I find that fascinating. And I have the feeling that that is sort of in tune with a change in our Western worldview. We are moving from an anthropocentric worldview, and all research shows it, to a more ecocentric worldview. More and more people are aware of the fact that we are not maybe the paragon of animals, that we're part of a wider network of relationships. And our, all sociologists can show you, and we, we've done a lot of work in Wagner University, that the Western worldview is changing. And I find that fascinating because the scientists suddenly we're also are doing different research. We're now looking at wood wipe webs. Never thought of 30, 40 years ago. Then we were studying competition between trees. Do you feel what I'm trying to say? It, by that same token, we're also reinterpreting evolution theory. Evolution theory in the 19th century became very much the survivor of the fittest, then interpreted as the strongest or the most competitive, which is not so strange because the whole evolution theory was hijacked by Herbert Spencer, who was an economic sociologist, biologist, and an, uh, an editor of The Economist. Now evolution theory is much more on, on symbiosis and, and, and cooperation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So are we independent of worldviews, ladies and gentlemen? When we study relationships between humans and nature and express it in, ter in a term like ecosystem services that we use a lot in all our scientific work, is there no implicit worldview there, ladies and gentlemen? So my first question is, are we independent as scientists of a worldview or are we part result of a worldview and perpetuating a worldview in our work. And then my second question would be, if we want to move to a post-humanist reality, which by, by many philosophers is, is necessary for a sustainable development, what does that mean for us as scientists? Can we, be, uh, can we perform our work in a worldview of partnership and participation? Does that mean that we need to, to change our paradigm? Or does it simply mean that we need to change what we study and how we communicate it? Because we not only have an inference, and we're not only, I feel, impacted, uh, let me put it another way, um, the question is, are we independent of worldview in what we study, in how we study it, and how we communicate it? And if we want to move to a different worldview, what does that mean in terms of what we study, how we do it, and how we communicate it? And that, ladies and gentlemen, is where I, as a scientist, ecologist, are constantly in a sort of a gray area with my philosophical inclinations. And I have to ask myself, oh, Jesus, philosophically or morally or ethically, I can take this stance, but what does that mean on how I approach an ecosystem and what I research in the ecosystem? And also, what does it mean for how I communicate what I found in the ecosystem to society? How do I frame my results? In other words, can I ever be free from a worldview? Ladies and gentlemen, that was my question to you. I hope that was clear enough. Yes, that was very, very clear. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, made me directly think, and I, I'm still processing, so <laughs> I think I should not start. Uh, but I'm not here alone. So we have Emma. Um, maybe you can introduce yourself as well, a little bit about your background. OK, yeah. Thank you, Matthijs, for your talk. Um, yeah, I'm, um, I'm Emma. I'm a philosophy student. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm interested in that too, and, uh, but I'm coming also from a background from sciences and uh, I, I have always wondered but what does it mean what we find as a scientist, therefore I studied philosophy. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> there are indeed no uh, answers, <laughs> um, only more questions. Um, yeah, 
Could I, could I ask you something? Yes. Already? Um, I was wondering um, because um, you mentioned Clive Hamilton and the use of the term post-humanist. Yeah. I was uh, wondering that whether that concept of post-humanist um, is not already an idea of that the human is Western and that we're now leaving that behind and that other worlds views um, about the human are not actually bad for nature. So whether uh, we, it, whether it is um, maybe um, better to talk not about post-humanist but about new, not a new human, but and yeah, another way of being human. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you see that the term post-humanist is used by philosophers, including Clive Hamilton, basically to, to point to a stance where we don't see ourselves as the center of all things or as the, uh, where we see ourselves as separated from nature and also standing basically above nature. Huh? So it's basically uh, um, uh, another view on being human, yes, absolutely. So I, I've never been very happy with the term post-humanist. Um, I would say post-anthropocentrist. That would be for me a, a more sympathetic term because in, in men, many non-Western civilizations, um, uh, humans are not seen, uh, you, the, the humans are not seen separated from the world and not seen as the only subjects in an objectified world. That's the point, yeah. And that's where, where Hamilton points at when he speaks about post-humanism and many other philosophers as well. It means basically that the nature-culture dichotomy, the nature-human dichotomy, which includes and in subject-object dichotomy, should be uh, crossed. Does that make sense? Certainly. But then the, the, the question is immediately, how can you then study it objectively? Yes. <laughs> nature. Yeah, I think uh, also to for the audience, um, you can join this discussion. I already there are already some questions coming in, but if you Good. have comments on on the questions that were posed by Matthijs, you can also put that in the Mentimeter, and I'll try to keep an eye on that and put it in whenever uh, yeah. it's suited. Um, and we also have uh, Sven here as well to join the discussion, so maybe you can introduce yourself as well quickly. Mm, yeah, of course. Uh... So I'm uh, Sven. I'm doing a PhD currently uh, in aerospace, actually. So uh, <laughs> nothing that. Uh, so I'm basically on the science side, right? Uh, not really the philosophical uh, background, nor the climate science background, but just uh, your your standard, I uh, guess, a scientist that's working on objectified things. So yeah, I found I found actually um, the talk very interesting. And uh, one question that I've been asking myself is. Uh, do we even have to objectify uh, nature or like the things around us to be able to study them? Uh, because it feels to me like it's, it's possible to, to study our environment even without objectifying while, while treating the environment with respect and mm -hmm. by treating the environment as a, as a subject or even as a thinking entity, uh, and not just as an object. Yeah, fascinating question and a very fundamental um, philosophy of science question. What do what what does the audience think? Can we study nature without objectifying it? There have been all kinds of efforts in the history of Western civilization. I just I just want to point that Goethe, the famous Goethe, who developed a whole interesting approach, new approach in in science, phenomenology. Um, and that's a different approach without, without uh, the, the strict objectifying. Yeah, can we, can, we, um, can we study nature without objectifying? You're all scientists, what do you feel? Yeah, I, I'm quickly going through the comments. Um, yeah. I also have my own idea about it. I think, I think a few people say that, it's, it's that we are all people also as a scientist. Um, so it's very difficult to separate the general worldview or where you're, mm. where you're raised from the way you study science. And also that a lot of the questions that are addressed with science, at least from natural science, also where I work in, are coming out of society. Yeah. Um, 
So, yes. so it's a bit steered by what society is interested Absolutely. in or, or needs. Uh, and in that way, it's very objective, uh, I would say, or at least objectifying nature in, in, in a way. Um, so I think that you, you can't really separate those two that easily. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, uh, there, there are, okay, I have to put in a few comments that are coming in now. Um, so one of the comments that, that that come in are more steered towards uh, also a thing that you asked, like how should we communicate as scientists? Yes, yes. I think that's that's something we're all very, very interested in. Um, and another question, um, uh, more generally, how do non-Western scientists answer these questions? Or, or mm -hmm. did you already have discussions with people uh, that are not, not Western or Western uh, minded? Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. Um, the first was the, the how do, the, the communication is also very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, what 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 you said, Stephanie, is um, of course we we are all humans, and in that sense, also scientists, we are part of a worldview. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, I mean, I I always found it very fascinating this whole concept of objectivity in science, which was um, uh, very important. Of course, in my training, it was a very important issue. And then my professor of botany was Victor Westhoff. He was a famous botanist in Hamming University. And there was, a, there was an enormous debate in vegetation science, how you could sample objectively. How can you sample vegetation objectively? And um, then he had a simple, simple, quote, a simple remark. Um, objectivity stops where the botanist stops his car. Uh, the moment you decide on researching something, we have already made a decision and that decision can never be completely objective because that's basically part of a society in which you live, of a worldview of which you're part and of the questions that are posed to you. So that's one thing. And I think we need to be aware of that because we always claim to be the objective students of reality. We always have to be aware of how implicit in what we do, quite a number of choices have already been made that are an expression of a worldview. The second thing is, if we find as scientists a um, relational reality, because that's what we do, when this we are always looking for causalities, if we find a proved causality between A and B, how do you communicate this? Do you communicate this as a flat causal relationship between A and B? Or do you communicate it as an um, expression of a complex reality in which there are numerous other A's and B's and C's and D's, which are also interrelated. You understand what I'm trying to say? In how you present your findings, you implicitly also represent the worldview. And a lot of the people that demand our research want a flat answer. If I do this, what will be the result? Hmm? And then we can provide that answer, but as in inherent in how we view the world, flat or broad, anthropocentric or non-anthropocentric, we communicate the reality that we have, um, that we have discovered. Huh? If I, you understand what I'm trying to say. And so, so communication is a very important aspect of that. Yes. And yes, I have met quite a number of non-Western scientists. The only point is that you might not call them scientists. <laughs> See, I had, I had a, a, a PhD student working in Myanmar and he worked with the Karen people. And it was about um, sustainable forest uh, management. And he worked with the Karen people that live in the forest and he moved in with all his Western, um, Western luggage of knowledge of tree species, ecological interactions and whatever, whatever, whatever. And he had local scientists, and the local scientists were simply the, the eldest of the clan who'd studied the forest all their lives, and had all the information of their ancestors because that had been handed down to them. And when the first walks into the, into the world of the forest started, Bram, that was the student's name, suddenly realized that he was viewing a different world from what the Myanmarese scientists were seeing. The Myanmarese scientists were seeing all kinds of relationships, real relationships for the Myanmarese scientist uh, between trees and between humans and between animals and between et cetera, et cetera, that for Bram were absolutely not accessible. And it took him six months before he started to realize that that Myanmarese scientific view of the forest was based 
basically, or an other set of, um, of let's say, uh, paradigms, largely based on experience. Experience of the tribe through the ages. Mm -hmm. And within that experience, Brahm could find whole, let's say, scientific mythologies that ultimately made also Western scientific sense. Because there were all causal relationships experienced by the Myanmar scientist that for Brahm suddenly made meaning from an ecological point of view. But it took some time before the different, the different uh, ontologies, because basically this has to do with ontology as well, ontologies met. So yes, I've met uh, non-Western scientists, absolutely. And um, to, yeah, to go back to that question, so, so um, on how to communicate it, um, I think, so, so I have a feeling that a lot of people in the audience are natural scientists and we yes. are very used to get an answer, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and I know that that's not going to happen today. Um, so also for the people at home, this is trying to find uh, or share ideas. Yeah, yeah. For me, the question just is, and I, I, I don't have the exact answer, mm -hmm. Stephanie, and none of us will have the exact answer, but we cannot evade um, uh, the reality that we are a humanity in crisis. And I would even claim in a greater crisis than humanity has ever been. Because the crisis of Anthropocene are global and, and we all have to face them. And they're so far reaching that we cannot continue our daily practice as we are used to. If we do that, there will be an enormous amount of suffering in the not too distant future. So we are a humanity in crisis. And when you are in crisis, you have to reassess your conditioned ways of viewing the world. Huh? And um, one of the, the, the major, for me, reassessments is, is now we have to reassess our role as humans in this crisis and in these crises. And by implication that for us as a scientific community also means we should reassess our role as scientists. We cannot claim any longer we are the objective explainers of the world, but we're not part of it. I feel that if we keep that stance, we won't be part of a solution. We won't be part of a sustainable future. Um, and you may, you may agree or not agree. If you say, no, I'm the objective observer, that's what I do and that's my role, great. But if you do not agree, and if you truly want to be part of the path to sustainability, that has repercussions for what we research, how we research it, and how we communicate it. And that's the basic question I'm, I'm asking. How can we as scientists contribute to a scientific future? Not just by telling this, causal relationship exists and if you do this then that will be a bit less and if you do that it will be a bit more because many philosophers claim the, the all these crises have ultimately emerged from the stance that we've taken as humans as subjects in a world of objects and can we ever move forward if we keep the world around us as an objectified reality yes <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Emma, you uh, yeah, want to respond? Um, yeah, indeed. One of the top questions was indeed uh, how we should indeed communicate whether we should stay neutral or include our values uh, yeah. and our worldview in the communication. Yeah. Yeah, the, the question is definitely about neutrality. The neutral scientist, objective scientist, can we ever be neutral and objective? Just by the way we perform our work. We are already, I, in my view, are continuing a worldview. Huh? And, and when we communicate, can we communicate valueless? Or should we communicate valueless? Is it not one of our obligations also as scientists to at least um, um, uncover the consequences of what we found also in the moral domain? Exactly. Yeah, I, I was a bit um, um, uh, wondering when we use the word object um, that on the one hand we 
we say, um, if we think differently about the world, we will not see the object anymore as object of the subject. But on the other hand, we also are saying we are um, not scientists who can say things objectively, but are those maybe two different kinds of things important in research to not objectify and to not present yourself as objective? Are that two different things? Yeah, I, I, find that, I find that a very fascinating question. And um, before I answer it, what do the other people feel? Because I think you're, you're getting to the heart of the matter. Stephanie, can you see the, the comments? Are there any comments on this question? Because that's quite a crucial question. Uh, not yet. Are people um, still there after all? Yeah, out? definitely. It's going very fast. So I'm trying to okay. end, try to figure myself and listen and, and see where the conversation is going. Maybe um, as Sven also said, what would it mean to see the other, um, your research, your object of research, not as an object, but as a subject in, with whom you talk? What, what would that mean for uh, doing research? How can we envision? that the thing we're researching has influence on us as well. Yeah. And how should we describe, should we just describe that in the, um, in lab reports or how, yeah, yeah. how does that work? Yeah. No, no, yeah, just, just to, to if, if, I might, if I might, it might make it maybe a little bit simpler. When you, when you research nature, from the perspective of ecosystem services, huh? you do research on causal relationships from a certain perspective. Hmm? When you would research nature with um, uh, as a basis, the establishment of a nature contract, you're researching different things from a different position. Because if you want to build a nature contract, you need to be aware of the interests of the other and that's the basis of a nature contract. If you research ecosystem services, you already have an implied valuation system. Huh? The services of nature to us. That's the value, the underlying value premise in your work. If you are a scientist researching the conditions or the, or the whatever, the paradigms of a nature contract, you are going to search other things. You are going to look at other relationships. So that, that's, uh, and that can still be done objectively, I think, but with a completely different my, uh, a completely different perspective. Yes. Can I maybe add to that? So uh, you compared that, that, that nature contract with a social contract, yeah. uh, where normally there's some form of dialogue uh, to get to that contract. Exactly. Um, and and uh, I mean, I find this fascinating. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but I wonder if if we as a, we as a scientists, of course, had a huge training to do the science we do at, at the moment, which I think the audience agrees on is not objective. Um, uh, and uh, um, shouldn't we relearn or maybe learn from others? I don't know how to have a dialogue with nature to find yeah. out how to establish this nature contract, and from there go try to communicate how we. <laughs> uh, do our research or, or what our findings are in that, that sense. And, and next to that, if I, if um, what is at the moment essential is that we, we accelerate this process, I think, to, yeah. to solve the crisis. And, and my fear as a scientist is that we, we will not be able to learn quick enough mm -hmm. um, to make this transition happen. Okay. Um, so, I mean, this is amazing that we have this now with a very natural based natural science-based yeah, audience, and yeah. I think everyone starts to thinking about this. Yeah. Um, but how can we accelerate this? Or how can we yeah. and train this in education in, in the Western system? Um, First, by keeping yeah. seminars like this, and many of them, <laughs> yeah. but also making seminars like this part of the education uh, in how we train scientists. Yeah. And I heard you say something very interesting, Stephanie. You talked about a dialogue with nature. Do you realize in saying that you take a completely different position when you simply say a dialogue with nature? Huh? In, that's not what a scientist normally does. You have no dialogue. Yeah. That's not how we in our objectified model approach the world. A dialogue implies mutual subjectivity. 
Yes. There's, there's a comment from the audience who said we should first all uh, un unlearn. Sometimes I, the interesting thing, have you ever, ever noted that many of the great scientific discoveries that were made by the, the great um, paragons of the development of science were when they unlearned things, when they crossed different um, fields. And great discoveries were always on the border areas between different scientific fields. And when you enter a new field of another field of, um, of, of science or academia, you have to unlearn a number of the condition things that you know from your own field and move into a dialogue with a new field. And very often there, something sparked that otherwise would not have been clear. And I think unlearning is not a bad thing for scientists. <laughs> Yes. And then suddenly, Sven, the universe looks quite different. Yes, of course. Uh, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm starting to doubt if we, I mean, are we ever, are we ever objective in our research, right? And yeah. uh, this, this discussion kind of also made me think about uh, that in a different way, because uh, looking at the fact that we are human. Uh, yeah can we even be completely objective right uh, so even even in our research uh, i i mean as a researcher i would be i would be crazy if i if i was uh, making discoveries and i would not follow up on them so in that sense the results of my research are always influencing me yeah uh, so even though many of us researchers might not think about the things that we research mm -hmm. as subjects uh, through our effort of researching mm -hmm. those things, we are getting answers from those mm -hmm. things. And I, th I think it's actually interesting that we talk about this, like when we're doing research, we're looking for answers. Absolutely. Uh, maybe it's it's not the question of looking for answers, but asking for answers, yeah, right? Absolutely. So we design our experiments yeah. as being yeah. questions yeah. Uh, to our mm -hmm. environment. Yeah. Uh, and we might not think about it. We might think of a very objective setup um, that is uh, grounded in, in in science, but in the end, we are uh, we are interested in something. We are asking yeah. questions to our yeah. environment, uh, and we are getting responses. Yeah. And based on those responses, we are formulating new questions that we yeah. try to find a way of asking. Yeah. So I guess thinking about it that way, are we not already as scientists in a constant dialogue with the environment? Yeah. If we're if we're good scientists, we are. Timothy Morton is an ecologist who claims that the true ecological mind is very difficult, he says, because it means that you're always open. And you ask a question, and the answer to that question poses new questions and new questions and new questions. And that's a sort of where science can become enchantment. Right? What science also re can reveal is the numerous interrelationships that with numerous new questions, which make the world an enchanted place. An enchanted place is always a place of subject of subjects. Huh? See, I'm not claiming that, that we should stop being objective scientists. No. Uh, in, in, in order to, 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 to get certain conclusions on certain aspects of reality, we need our paradigm of the objective uh, researcher. What I'm claiming is that whatever we do within that paradigm of objectivity is never free from a worldview or a subjective surrounding in which it will be framed. What we choose to study, when we choose to study it, and how we communicate it, that's all implied in uh, our position as a human in a worldview. The result of what we find when we do an experiment, that's one thing. But then the fact that we study this already has a background huh? that has a that has a worldview and a societal background, and then how we communicate that also comes part of a bigger whole. And that's the awareness I try to point out. We cannot be objective bystanders in a journey to disaster, can we? And just describing how it happens. Yes, the Titanic is moving to the iceberg. We can exactly research how it does it. And constantly tell the captain how it works. And should we not say at some point, maybe you should steer a little bit to the right? That's my point. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I think yeah. it's an important uh, aspect of our scientific work is not just to be as objective as possible, exactly. but also yeah. to make uh, suggestions to the public or yeah. to uh, public yeah. figures about how to move forward. But I do think even this, what, what you call the object, I, I guess we all call it the objective approach. And I'm kind of wondering if that's even the best name for it. Yeah. Uh, because in the end, I think already our approach of uh, using the scientific method yeah. isn't that already a worldview no. that we hold yeah. uh, because no, I I, it's kind of sad to look around but more and more people seem to not actually follow that worldview that rigorous scientific experimentation yeah. can uh, kind of lead us towards truth yeah. about our environment about the universe yeah. Uh, about our reality yeah. uh, and uh, with this uh, there, there's like kind of a whole bunch of, sort of new realities kind of yeah. uh, forming uh, I think um, yeah. yeah you mentioned Donald Trump and I think he was a very uh, he started that to bring that into the like public yeah. focus of those yeah. alternative realities where people yeah, suddenly yeah, exactly. yeah. Um, and that do no longer trust the scientific method so maybe at this point we should actually become aware that already the scientific method itself is uh, a worldview question. that we hold, that yeah. we believe yeah. uh, yields the best results uh, yeah. about the truth of reality. Yeah. Okay. But where does it leave us? What do we do next then? <laughs> yeah. uh, how can we be, how, that's the basic question, how do we become part can we become part of a changing worldview, a less instrumental worldview, a more coherent worldview, a more ecocentric worldview, and a more sustainable worldview? I think yeah. that's a, yeah, a, a, a nice open question maybe to end with, yeah. uh, unfortunately. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I wish we could continue this and maybe we will, um, where we're not live anymore um but unfortunately we have to wrap up for now um i think it has been fascinating maybe we'll repeat a session in the next year um when we have thought about it a bit more or make it uh, more specific um but for now thanks a lot for being here um and thanks to the audience for tuning in and sending so much questions that i unfortunately could not read all of them <laughs> um and um just to let the audience know, um, we have a next webinar planned in January uh, by Charlie Gardner, and it will be about civil uh, disobedience. Um, and I hope to see you all next year there. And for now, uh, of course, happy holidays. Um, and maybe take this webinar home and uh, uh, think about it, and uh, especially talk about it with uh, your colleagues and your friends and your family. Uh, that's it. So thanks for being here. and. Uh, See you next year. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.